I'm Bram. I'm a good New England kid. I'm actually from Connecticut, just outside of New York, where the Constitution State and or where most of the firearms started. I had firearm companies, Colt, uh, Remington, uh, Ruger, were all around there. So I'll, I'm a good like Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. I used to tell people, especially on the floor, people, what did we call you? I said, Bram. It was good enough for my mom. And that for me, you know, rank could be pretty rank. Like they say, you know, rank mean bad, but um, skill is rank. Uh, several of the groups, um, Vincente Sanchez, Roland Dantes, and uh, Remy Prezos Council recognized me as a Datu. And because it's all within our family, I mean, the paper's cool. And it's my love of Arnie. So but people call me all sorts of, you know, I have people still call me Sifu, people call me Guru, other call me Master. And I go, I don't need that off the floor. I don't actually need it on the floor. Um, but officially, I guess I'm Datu slash Grandmaster Bram Frank, but I'm really Bram. My father is the, the late Robert Gould, the artist illustrator. He taught at Yale and some other place, taught different stuff. And my mom is also, she was a professor and eventually wanted to be a doctor of psychology and teaching in the universities. So they're real big on books and all stuff. So I grew up always being at the Metropolitan Museum. I love arms and armor. I always wanted to be a knight in armor. And I, my mom, you know, I read all sorts of myths and legends and I wanted to be one of those kind of warriors. And being from a Jewish family, Jewish kids don't fight. Um, my dad, when he was growing up, because he was a painter and artist restoration, working his way through school, he found old Japanese prints and everything of samurai and whatever, and I grew up with them, and they encouraged me to learn culture, and nothing was better than watching guys with swords and everything, and, you know, guys in plate armor, and I love uh, Middle Ages through Renaissance armor, and some ancient, ancient stuff, you know, ancient, ancient, and all that stuff of armor, and the fact that they're fighting gave me a love for martial arts, and we, they had a friend that did Variani, uh, Ajahn from India when I was very little and told me about the Kshatriya and the, and the warriors of India. And I, I fell for all of it. I always wanted to be a warrior. And they used to tell my mom, because she wanted to be, you know, if Bram does this, because the myth was you, you ruined your hands, you know, the old karate guys hitting Makawara, that I couldn't be an artist. And I went, I really want. I came up to his pack and I grabbed it and that put his hand here. Which meant I could put the, the ramp in. I can use the ramp to Alex Stern, Rabbi Alex Sternberg back then used to teach for the Jewish Defense League, him and Harvey Kurtzman. And that's how I got to meet Jerry Deutsch down here. We met way back a long time ago. Jerry was head of Wells Fargo Security. He trained with Harvey. Um, Alex back then used to come to all the Jewish community centers and he was teaching all of us martial arts so that the Nazi stuff would never happen again. The Holocaust, that we were gonna make sure we were trained. And so I started in, in Shotokan and I always wanted to do Kung Fu. And they opened uh, Jerome Mackey's back then. Jerome Mackey used to go from town to town and find the best martial arts to have schools and employ them. And they opened up and I got to start learning Hungar Kung Fu. And my instructor had a bad car accident. So they, this little kid comes in with those uh, 60s platform heels and the, the uh, Beatles haircut, little tiny guy. And he's not paying any attention when he teaches us. Nothing. You can see he, he's only doing this to collect a paycheck. But I'm into it. I'm going to do it. And he meets me and waits for everyone to leave, comes up to me and goes, do you want to learn how to fight? And I'm like, what the hell do you think I'm doing? He goes, really? He goes, stop me. And he comes right at me and he traps me up, starts smacking me around and goes, I thought you knew how to fight. And I went, what's that? And he goes, you will pay regular class and you'll bring me in from New York two times a week, and you'll pay for private lessons. I went, done. So I was to bring Steve Chen Lee in from New York, from the Tiger Crane School. We do Hungar with all the other people, and I wasn't allowed to say anything. Then he taught me whatever this art was. And after a while he goes, you need someone else to train with. Pick the number two kid in class. So I remember the kid's name. I get sort of with Bob Terenzio. I walked up in the locker room and said, you want to learn how to fight? He goes, Bram, what do you think we take Hungar for? I said, stop me. I still have no idea what it's called. Don't know what I'm doing, but I trap him up. I come right down the line. I smack him and bounce him all over. He goes, what the hell is that? We don't do that in class. I go, I know. We're not supposed to talk about it. 
but we have to pay Steve. And of course, Steve was smart because it wasn't like I pay, we're going to pay him once and he come in. We each had to pay him another full fee to come in. And Bobby's house was closer with a bigger basement. So we're training Bobby's house. But in those days, it's, it's a hippie's day. So people are getting stoned. People are, are drinking. So he made us, even though we were fairly, do both. He goes, I don't know what shape you'll be in, but I want you to be able, whether you're drunk or whether you're high, defend yourself. I still have no idea what we're doing. And we do it religiously and we can't do it in class. So Bobby and I beat on each other. Then the Bruce Lee movies come out. Bobby and I are watching and we go, hey, we do that because we could see, and obviously it was a little bit different, doing his JKD, but we could see what obviously we didn't know was Wing Chun. So Wing Chun became a core art for me and has maintained itself through my modular, my CSSD, it's affected my Arnese. And the first time Remy actually saw me doing anything, he went, oh, you do Arnese. I said, actually, no, I do Wing Chun. And I, I got to spend time with William Chung doing private lessons. And his version of traditional Wing Chun truly affected the Wing Chun I'd already learned. And I had a very serious accident, sort of wiped my hard drive clean. And But what stuck with me is a bastardized conceptual version of Wing Chun, which has affected all my arts. Um, I used to write up for Normal and uh, High Times and uh, uh, Since Media Tips. And I had something because I'm a big one of the Constitution. So com Thomas Paine's Common Sense is one of the most amazing things. Common Sense told us what we're supposed to do to get rid of the king and why we needed our rights and why we had to fight the king of England. That stuck with me. And most people don't have common sense. So common sense, be it um, self-defense or street combat, is my way of expressing the FMA in a way I would want it taught and applied in a simplistic gross motor skill application uh, to the guys that I teach. And you can always make things more complex, but I find that if I work at a, at a street gross instinctive level, since I can't get anywhere past that, I can't forget that under duress. So common sense self-defense became a way that I expressed my old combat arnis and my tactical arnis and put it into a whole package that I can have different tools and express it from impact tool to edge tool to projectile tool because they take extreme close quarter projectile tool and show them that it's still FMA. Um, and that common sense to me was a way of going, I need you to think about the simplest stuff, not the, not the fancy stuff. And that you can't go about, I'm going to kill someone. Well, you know what? That's a nice romantic attitude in the fantasy world, in Dungeons and Dragons. But in real world, I cannot go out there with attitude. Everybody who insults me or gets, I'm just going to kill them. So you need to have some common sense. And that's about judicious use of force, how we apply it. And I think FMA is real big about levels of force. We always talk about defanging the snake and working our way through which is very, again, HEMA. I cut your hands off, I cut your arms off, you still don't get it. Turn to the Black Knight from Monty Python and the Holy right. Grail. You know, I worked my way up. I learned about FMA from the Filipinos in general at the college who were in the art department with my dad as they talked about it and it sort of, you know, around me, beyond me, but I paid attention. I'm a good Mensa kid. I don't know if you know what Mensa is. Mensa is the high IQ society. There's several of them. Mensa is actually the lowest of the group. You have to be higher than the 98th percentile, meaning that, you know, you have to be in the upper 2% or you don't qualify. I call, I'm a, a triple niner. But anyways, I read, therefore I am. So I used to read stuff like Don Drager and I always to read about arms and armor. Arms and armor, I read about ancient Filipino arms and armor because I read about Chinese and Asian and Japanese arts and Malaysian stuff. And Don Drager used to talk about the Philippines. So that added to what these people had told me. I got to learn about it. I still didn't know any doing it. Like I said, I was doing Wing Chun and Guru Dan talked about some Filipino arts. And then I saw something about this guy, Remy Presas. And I see a couple step-by-step -step pictures of Remy Presas. And as soon as I saw him doing it, I went, him, I want to do what he does. 
and I didn't get to meet, you know, start training them until 1980. Um, and you know, the Chinese have a saying, when you're ready for the teacher, he comes to you, you don't go to them. But, you know, he came up to the mountains of Vermont, well, actually to Massachusetts, I came off the mountain, so he came to where I was, where we could actually get together. And after that, I started following him, but modern Arnis. And he's actually introduced me to other people. Um, he sent me to go meet Guru Dan. He would bring people to his seminars, say these are, as we were joking about, you know, other Titos or other cousins. And they're just other Filipinos, part of the big Filipino family. And you go, Bram. You know, he'd tell everyone, you only need modern or niece. He'd go, Bram, come here. He'd go study with them. Yeah, but I just paid to spend all this time. What did I tell you? So I'd spend two or three days. Whoever was at the seminar that he brought, I would go train with them. He'd go, what do you think? And uh, good or bad. But it, because I, he gave me a chance to be a knight in armor. Every other martial art, you do whatever level you do. You're not supposed to do the level over you, even if you can do it. And if you're very, very good after you're a black belt, we'll show you Kabuto. We'll show you some kind of weapons. What's the first thing we do in FMA? They stick a tool in your hand and go, let me show you about a tool. And Remy would talk about blades. So every time, and I love arms and armor and stuff. And he catered. Like in a way, what way Bruce taught to who you were, Remy taught to who we were. There's a group of us in that first generation, whatever our strengths were from previous time, he fed to that and he knew I wanted blades. And at one point he gave me a choice. I could do the family art of bolo or I could do sticks, not both, because you can't. They have a commonality but there's a big gap between them because stuff I can, and I, I'm amazed by people who do tappy tappy. I'm amazed by Bolinta Walk. You know, because Remy originally did Bolinta Walk with Bacom. You know, he's a Bolinta Walk. He added that to the family art, which is how he got modern Arnis. That's why they're, they're so similar. That's why so many modern Arnis people gravitate to Bolinta Walk to find out what was the Corvoy do, and some haven't come back. You know, they stayed with Bolinta Walk, especially now that Remy's passed. They're, they're, they're sort of this, they're into, you know, and they have such commonality. But for me, when it, it came up to it, Remy gave me every chance to back out. You know, my family did this as bad. Um, people don't like training police and military, don't pay attention. This is what, you know, it's a very hard thing. It's very simple and there's a finality. And I went, he either wants me to look and go, I want to do you and a family do or go, okay, you're right. I'll only do stick. And I went, forget it. So all the beauty of the art, and the stick is the beauty of the art. There's no question about it. I, over time, cannot do it because how you train is what you do. And I cannot, and William Chung, I got all the way back to William Chung. He looked at me and said, I will never let you beat me. If you beat me, that's okay. But in training, I will not leave an opening for you to learn. If you can make it, you take it. I went, what an arrogant attitude. But I began to understand because he goes, I might do that in combat, I might hesitate. Like I've hesitated with student, I cannot afford to hesitate. The last thing you want is to lose your blade. So abanico means I'm only corner to corner. From corner to corner, just step in. I don't generally teach the public. I teach military and security. And security, not like the guy that sits behind the desk. I teach Israeli and Russian security and that kind, where security is much higher than police. They kill bad guys. They go after terrorists. Um, I teach military groups. Someone said, what are you doing? I said, well, it's a different application because to me, there's three different versions of every art. There's traditional art. And traditional, I don't mean it bad in any way. There's all the different, all the cool things that go with it because it's an art form. Not that the art form is ineffective, not that it can't be deadly. It's all of that stuff, but there's the art form. Then there's sport. Sport is not the same as the traditional part. And there's rules. And sparring is a big part. It's great timing stuff, but it's almost like dueling in a way. Dueling is not fighting. Even f dueling to the death is not fighting. It's dueling. And then there's the combative arts. They have a commonality, but they don't work in each other's realm. And we were in Germany. I was with Dan Anderson, Grandmaster Dan Anderson, who's obviously one of the best karate fighters in the history of karate and a stunning modern Arnese practitioner, he looked up and the Germans were talking to him and he said, look, your instructor is a practitioner and he's a technician. He said, no, no, he's a fighter. And Dan went, no, no, I'm a fighter. 
I can apply technicians and I'm getting better, but I'm a fighter. That's what I do. I'm one of the best fighters out there. I fight all the time. Your guy is a stunning technician, and he is. They said, well, what's him? And he goes, we don't play in his ballpark. And I had a bunch of my guys there, and no one, you know, they treat me like it was a jerk. I'm the, you know, I'm there in my BDUs and my shirt, and they're all in their pajamas. And I had some, my German friends who just, students who just come back from Iraq and Afghanistan, and they started talking to them and went, explained what we do and goes, Mr. Frank, we didn't realize. Our instructor said, you're just some weird guy with knives. We didn't realize you're not a sport guy. You're not, as Dan explained to the technician, you're a combatives guy and your guys go after bad guys. I go, right. Well, why didn't you say something? I said, because you guys wouldn't have believed me. But you talk to your other German guys from the German Ranger Battalion. He goes, oh my God, do you know who they are? I said, well, actually I do. They're my students. They go, sir. They tell us your stuff keeps them alive. And I go, yeah, that's my area. Um, and that's what Remy taught me. Bolo has a finality to it. It's very simple. And it, you, you can't play with it. Well, let me correct that. You can play once. You see people, the sticks under the people's arms. And people leverage it and come up. Well, if I leverage a Bolo that way, my arm's coming off. Um, I'm sure you did it where you put the stick and decide how the stick, what size stick you have on people. Well, that's actually for a bolo or a blade because if it goes from the palm of my hand to my armpit, that means it's just short enough to turn on the inside of my arm and not cut me. I don't need to do that with a stick, but I need to do that with a blade. Um, I don't come from under my arm. I have to train. Everything's got to go outside my arm. Or and I, I look at people bump into their elbows. I said. You realize if that's a blade, the tip of your elbow is on the floor. So anyways, I know that, that that's what affected how I do arts and why the FMA. The FMA and Remy let me be a, a knight in shining armor. Here's the flat. Step up with your lift. Ah, feel where you got the shot? Yeah. Dang. The fact that we are a practical, we're a tribal art. Most of the others are a structured art. So that... If someone was attacking our village, and in a short period of time, you'd put a stick in my hand, because real war is fought with tools, not empty hand, and you would show me how to use something as simple as a stick to defend my family and my life. You wouldn't care about empty hand. You would show me how to actually hit someone with a tool to make sure I'd survive, because as Fairburn and Sykes used to say in Applegate, the last thing a soldier wants to do is find out he's got his empty hands. Soldiers, we don't fight wars with empty hands. So Filipino arts is the exact opposite of everything else. They put a tool in your hand first, because if you learn tool usage, your hands get faster. You also learn not to stick your hands in the blender. You know, you have to understand how to use it. And unfortunately, with a blade, one person drips, the other gushes, and it could quickly become one person gushes, and the other's got a toe tag. And the Filipino arts are conquistador fighting arts that we get to do. Asian fighting arts aren't. In the Philippines, you have almost 400 years of being colonized by the Spanish. And the Spanish were, along with the Portuguese, the toughest fighters on the face of the planet. People are, well, they had guns. They just said, excuse me, those ships hold 150 people at best. They packed their horses on it. Gunpowder gets wet. They didn't have extra shot because they needed for fresh water, for food, and they're stuck in a ship for a couple of years and everywhere they went, they beat the snot out of everybody. Oh, the samurai are the toughest people. If the samurai were that tough, the Spanish and Portuguese would not have owned all the ports and all the trade. They would have gotten rid of them. Everyone, the only reason we don't speak Spanish is the Armada went down twice. The weather and the shoals and the, and the ocean went against them. The English didn't defeat them per se, square on. If there weren't two nat, two giant typhoons didn't come up out of nowhere, we'd all be speaking Spanish. There'd be no British people. And the Spanish brought the Filipinos all over the world and Ronin Samurai who were on their ships. And if you look at what they do, everything we do, because there is no ancient Filipino fighting arts. There's no recorded stuff before the 50s. And any of the old stuff is all verbal. And everything we do has bastardized Spanish in it, and we fight in Spanish fighting vests and well, our pajamas look at our motions and our stepping. Nobody steps in quarters in Asia. Only we do. 
The clock system is HEMA, Historical European Martial Art. They don't use a clock system anywhere else. All of our motions. So if you want to learn the toughest fighting systems world, added with you know different some of the Chinese influence and Kun Tao, because Kun Tao is Filipino Chinese arts rather than a Penjat and a, a Pencat, which is Indonesian Malaysian. But you know it's Chinese fighting arts without all the crap, and that's real Filipino in your face. So Filipino fighting arts gave me a chance to do historical conquistador fighting. It gave me a chance to understand arms and armor of something that I already could relate to. I didn't have to do Chinese arts. I didn't have to do Japanese arts. I didn't have to do Thai arts. And it's why a lot of Asians hate the Philippines. They're 99% Catholic. They're very European-based and their whole fighting systems. And again, people go, well, they used to fight before the Spanish. I understand that, but it wasn't codified. What we call FMA didn't exist before we you know, took Spanish fighting arts and bastardized them and made up what we do now. It's the coolest thing in the world. And Filipino arts, what I like about them better is they want you to teach. Every other art, you don't teach till I tell you. Day one, Remy looked and said, go teach. I went, go teach? He goes, yeah. How will you know what you know if you don't go teach it? FMA is the coolest thing in the world. FMA asks us to be us. And the beauty is, it's like the stars in the sky. There's countless styles, and we all have a commonality of concept. I love it. And people want to make wars about it. I go, no, no. We should revel in the diversity and share with each other going, oh, yeah, you do that way. Oh, I do it this way. Oh, look at this. Because it one's not better than the other. They're all cool. So I, I love the FMA, and obviously I love the Philippines, and I'm, I'm married to a Filipina. Um, the Filipino arts have totally affected my life. It's how I see my art. I designed my knives and my blades around it, and it's made my martial arts. It gave me a place to take my Wing Chun fit, my Wing Chun, not anybody else. My Wing Chun and everything, FMA gave me a place to make it the arts within my art. I cannot thank the Philippines and FMA more, and Remy for opening all these doors. This swing here, see, it's very important. And this swing here, it's right. As a person, he had warts and bumps and good parts like everybody else. I know people like to put him on a pedestal. Um, he was a man. And what I liked was we hugged each other, we yelled at each other, and we loved each other. You know, I, I met him as a person. Um, he was a realist. He taught me about keep your friends close and keep your enemies closer. He taught me about uh, he used to roll his eyes at a lot of things and do stuff. Um, as a teacher, he was a phenomenal doer. And when, you know, when he would set it up and do stuff, he expected us to follow it. He didn't always follow the same pattern. It took the first generation students who ran the camps, and especially a couple of us, to actually write everything down and try to organize it. Because there was no organization. You know, he would teach in a certain, he, had, he ended up with a pattern because he's the one who started all the seminar training. No one else did seminar training before. I mean, that's a, he traveled around the country and he started those instructor camps. But training with him, he was very caring. So when he did his very first videos, he said, oh, Bram, which one do you want? And I said, all of them. And you and I have discussed on the side, you, you couldn't get copies. So I had a friend in the Marine Corps make me copies. And I bought a $1,200 special machine, which my wife almost killed me because I had to put it on credit, that did frame by frame, slow motion, you know, super slow motion and slow motion. So what do you want? And I would put his tapes on there so I could watch everything he did. So it's what he doing. Well, when I would show up to see him, he knew I was practicing and watching because that's all he did, eight hours a day, sometimes more as I practice. And he looked up and if you put energy in, he gave you energy back. And if you thought you caught up to him, he would just move it up a notch. And we sometimes would be in a hotel room or my house, and I realized he's like this. What's he doing? He's watching television while we're doing this. And I'm thinking, how can he be watching? He's not even paying attention. And then he'd pick it up because I'd sort of sneak something in. He'd pick it up. And he's still not looking at me. And I went, damn, put me in my place. But he was cool because he never degraded you. I had that in other martial arts schools where, you know, we get yelled at how stupid you were, why didn't you do this? If you didn't do something right after a few times, he would roll his eyes and go, yeah, you could do that. That was a death knell, by the way. If he ever said, yeah, you could do that, 
because that meant, sure you could. It's not what I want you to do. But you, and we had some guy come up to Dan and me and the other go, hey, he said I could do that. We all went, whoa. It was cool. He was fun because he said, I want you to fund doing it. And it was his art. He didn't inherit an art from someone else. He made modern art niece. When you're learning someone's own personal art, they treat it differently. And I'm, I'm just blessed that he, he and I were family in a way. And I was never in line. I never said it that I was inheriting modern niece. I'm the next one to get the whole. I'm just blessed that I was allowed to get the legacy of the bolo and teach the family art and keep it alive because he knew that was my strength. So training with him was, was very cool because he was very open. He never shut you out. He never purposely, yes, he broke me in little pieces at times, but it was just in the matter of training. He was never cruel, he was never mean, and he would give you lots of extra time. Lots of people went for rank. They, they really wanted the rank, and Remy had two separate divisions. We had rank and we had instructor. You know, because he, he taught at the University of Santo Tomas, and he got his stuff into the school system there, and he loved being people teaching, so he ran instructor camps. You keep an art going by making instructors, not practitioners. Practitioners come and go, but instructors share the art. So you want to make instructors. And um, when I did up the camp curriculum, and when I finally published my book on our niece, I took the old camp curriculums and I just you know, copied what, the forms we handed out, because I made the forms and handed them out. So I took a couple of the pages, and the last page was pretty much the same on all the different camps. And it asked, what was your belt rank, you know, what you, and what you were graded to, and then it said, you were either a basic or an advanced instructor. And people thought it was just two levels. And we had 10 levels of advanced instructor. So for me, I had never tested for, for belt level. I always did the instructor testing. And he came to me one day and said, oh, Brahm, uh, what will you do when I die? I said, I'm going to be very sad. He goes, no, no, what will you do? I said, I'm going to cry. He goes, no, no, what will you do? I said, what will I do about the art? So do I have teaching certificates. You know, I want to be one of your best instructors. And this is before the whole tappy tappy part, which became a whole different issue at the seminars. I was, you know, we're doing stick, but I'm still doing knife. I'm the not, I'm used to affectionately going the man with the knife. I was the man with the knife and the bolo guy. And he would openly say that, oh, we'll have Bram come, we'll do knife. We didn't teach knife in public. And uh, he said, but you don't have rank. And this is what I meant about having your own art. I looked at him and went, what do I care about rank? So part of him was very proud because obviously I wasn't chasing paper. The other part of him was highly insulted that it's not an art he inherited or he's grown up in another art and done it. This is an art invented. and here's a guy going, eh, I don't care. And he goes, no one will believe you. I said, well, I have a teaching certificate. He goes, you need to get rank. I said, okay, give me whatever you think I should have. And he goes, no, no, they'll say I gave it to you. I'm like, uh, did I miss something here? And he goes, start over. So I started over. Made it to my first degree. Goes, looked at me and goes, now what? I said, are you happy? He goes, what is that attitude? I said, I've got the first degree. You happy? And I'll go back to my, go start over. So this time I went through second degree. And I went, you happy now? He goes, Brom, what did I tell you? I went, I know, start over. And we went back and we became a joke with us through all the tests over all the years of doing it and starting over. And people went and said, it's a game between us because he knows I love him. And he used to hug me. Well, I said, people used to think we were weird because right in public, I'd hug him, I'd kiss him and go, I'd love you. He'd tell me he loved me. And I never cared about him. And I would just show up at odd times, especially because he said, go teach. So guess what I did? I went out on the world and taught. And if I wasn't teaching, I'd show up. And Dan used to correct Joe and his brand, if we add up all your degrees, you have a sixth degree like the, the other rest of us. And I went, very funny. That was one thing. But I always, as you said, when he asked about an instructor, being an instructor is important to me. I run instructor camps now in his honor. Teaching is the most important thing because I think if you teach, you learn fastest. And that's what Remy believed. So yeah, being with Modern Arnis was about, to me, being an instructor to then move the art further ahead. They've all been transferred one technique to another. It's all luck. You know? Yeah. Has the art changed? All arts evolve. I watch modern artists change as Remy himself changed. 
you know, he changed. His age was changing, his understanding. And sometimes he went from small motions, he became bigger motions. What do you do? And he goes, it's easier for him to understand. We went from what we call left to right single stick sparring, and that became tappy tappy. And for us, left to right, most people missed, was, you know, we'd be doing in our right hand and he would change up because he was really left-handed. I'm really left-handed. There's a few of us like that, you know, and in the Jewish religion and Catholic, that's bad, bad to be left-handed. So he always used his right hand, but he would change up. People said, and he'd go, you have to know left hand. If your right hand can do it, your left hand can do it. You have to know what your left hand does, and you have to know mirror. Mirror image is both people in left hand compared to being right-handed. Using your left hand, I said, don't you get it? He's teaching your left hand to do right-handed motions. So in his honor, I call my second most important position left to right, backwards, because he was teaching us how to use our left hand to do right-handed motions. If you go, I don't get it. Well, are you single stick sparring? You're sparring with him right to right, yes. Can you tell when he changes hands? No. So he's making his, you, if otherwise, you couldn't do it. So in being an instructor and understanding that, understanding the perspectives, which is how I got module, I had to understand his perspectives. Yes, being an instructor was the most, and I watched his FMA change, which led to my FMA. And I think all things have to evolve. You know, if things don't evolve, they die. Evolution is important. It doesn't mean you lose the core. Sometimes it's just your perspective or how you approach it or explain it that might change. But the core part, because we only have two arms. You know, we're either open or we're closed. End of story. We don't work behind our back. You know, so some of the core stuff for Filipino arts at work is, you know, I'm open or I'm closed. I'm open, closed, open, closed. Or they follow. I open, I open, I close, I close. I can alternate. Or what we call cinewali. I can weave. End of story. So those things, you know, you have a principle, open and closed, never changes. A conceptual, the three ways of putting it, you know, alternate, follow, or weave. And then the rest is personal. And that changes by time, by tool, whatever. So I expect FMA to change. And I think FMA today, even though some people don't like it, I think is better. Because we openly share with each other. You know, where family styles get shared with each other, different approaches get shared, and we do lots of cross-training with each other within FMA. Whereas before it might be my family. You know, Remy is across the island from, uh, from Leo. They're on the same island. They didn't mix side to side. Being in Negros, all they had to do was cross the water. They're in Cebu. And eventually that's how Remy got to you know, go train with Bocconi, went to Cebu, but most people didn't do that back then. You know, my style, my family's better than yours, we don't share these secrets. Today, what I think is better, I think what's, people are more open. We have open seminars and we share more. I know people say we're yelling at each other, but I think that's a minority. The people want to have big mouths. I think overall most of us want to share with each other, not go, mine's better, do this. Let me show you how I do it. Oh, that's how you do it, that's cool. And we add to our library. We all want to share. It's the arts within our arts, and I think that's for the betterment of FMA. No, because I say there's a right way, then there'd be a wrong way. And I don't think there's really a wrong way. I think the wrong way is telling everyone, and I've made some videos about that when you go, I pull out my tool and I, I immediately hack you up. You know, I punch out your eyes, I cut your throat, I disembowel you, I'm like, what is that? That's wrong to me. I think that's just mayhem and destruction. Is there a wrong way overall, you know, like instruction-wise? That's why I went, even I separate them. I love learning the traditional, whatever the family arts are from any family. You know, I don't care how complicated it is and all this stuff. I think that's cool. There's a beauty to the art, and that art can be deadly. The sport part, there's some stuff that works in sport. The wrong way to teach it? Well, only wrong if it doesn't work within those rules. You know, it's like Taekwondo competition is not the same as karate. So people who learn different rules and ways of approaching couldn't go back and forth. So like if you did the WKA instead of the PKA, WKA allowed leg kicks. Well, there's no leg kicks in the PKA. So wrong teaching would be to go, use this all the time. Uh, hello, that would get you disqualified. Um, in the PKA, because we didn't allow leg kicks, you had to have a minimum of 
it used to be 10, they moved down to eight. You had to have eight kicks per round or you were disqualified. So if you taught someone else differently, that's teaching them improperly. Um, if you tell someone eye jabs are okay, but there's no eye jabs allowed, that's teaching improperly. And then you get to combatives. If you're teaching people something that will get them killed or injured, that's improper. But as a stylistic way, I don't, there, there's no wrong. But if you have body armor on, and uh, Leo Harone talked about this, that when he was out in the field, he did some basic stuff. Japanese soldier, I mean, he, he cut him what he knew, put the guy down, immediately turned the other guy. That first cut went across the guy's bandoliers. It did absolutely nothing. And he's just lucky that he took out guy two to come back to finish guy one and said, I'll never make the mistake again. He used to say, make sure you know what you're doing. So teaching it wrongly would be, I tell you, don't worry. It's like you're wearing a T-shirt. I teach you stuff that works in a T-shirt. Then I put you in a zone where people are wearing body armor so that 90% of what I taught you doesn't work. So that's teaching wrongly. Other than that, no, I don't think there's any wrong way to teach it. I don't care if you teach it the long way that I want you as my student for 400 years traditional. You have a short lifespan as a, a peak athlete because athlete, you cannot be an athlete forever and compete at a high level. Or combatives. Combatives need a lot more common sense and a lot of people mistake that some of us old guys are just as dangerous as the young guys. But I don't think there's a wrong way per se. As long as they don't violate something to get each person either thrown up by rules or get some killed, there's no wrong way. That's actually something Dan and I have been talking about. I'm in my head, I'm 18 and stupid. As I approach 70, as Dan said, we've become the old guys in the art. Um, I'm always amazed when like Doug Mercado comes up to me and Doug goes, Bram, you realize you're one of the pioneers. And I, I, I don't see it that way. I can't see myself that way. But I have people go, sir, do you understand who you are and what you've done? Um, as my mom said before, she goes, you realize you've changed the knife world. I said, I know, she goes, they go, you know, you've changed and a great deal in the martial arts world because of your approach to your knives and your blades. I go, I got it. So I'd like my legacy, you know, every time you pick up a knife, that's me. My idea of how a knife should work and build in the Filipino attributes into a tool, the soul of Bram is in my knife. So my knives, when I pass away, um, my wife will have to do nothing but have whatever the, the whole lineup of knives are just made. She can change the handle material, the blade material, but how they work will already be set. My training program, I've started concentrating new instructor programs. I've made them simpler. You know, I used to answer, I answered questions that nobody asked. I had some very complicated stuff. I rammed everyone through it. I've taught teams back and forth. And over time, I found a bunch of stuff just didn't come up. Not that you can't practice it, not that you didn't have an answer, but spending time on it was pointless. So I've made new definitive type stuff. So I've been pushing more instructor programs because after I'm gone, especially in today's world, we have books and we have videos and I have almost everything's recorded. So the, everything that is Bram can be downloaded and seen. It's not like you just go, oh, Bram used to do this and you try to explain what I did. I have books explaining it step by step. There are videos of me explaining it step by step. In a professional sense, you know, like when I teach for military and law enforcement and uh, security, the, the programs have to have goals on them. What are you supposed to achieve from this? What will happen? What's going on? And they're full programs with presentations. Every family in the Philippines has their own version. Look out for the cults. Look out for the people who tell you everybody else is bad. As soon as they tell you someone else is bad and only do my way or I'm better, those are the ones don't bother training with them. Now that doesn't mean they may not have a little piece of truth in them, you know, of what they teach, but I would avoid those people. The ones who want to tell you what I say is the bottom line and the ones who are using the power to abuse women, children, and other for their own needs, sexually, whatever, I would avoid them. The ones who tell you they're going to make you ultimate warriors and kill everyone, anything that violates common sense, I would avoid them. And like I said, you, and you've seen now, especially on, on video stuff in today's world, people want to make themselves better by trashing other people. 
those are the only ones I would avoid. I don't think there's any, no FMA, whatever FMA school is in your area, I would do it. Overall, I think FMA is the coolest thing in the world. I think FMA encourages us to be unique, to grow, and to share. And if you can find an FMA, with today's online stuff, you can actually do it with your kids and practice and do some online stuff. But I would go to any FMA school. And again, with the, the caveat about please watch out for those who want to trash others or they're the best or they're the only ones or I'm going to make you a bloody killer bad influence in today's world but I think FMA encourages family and family is important I think FMA encourages an understanding of tools help us do stuff tools can also be dangerous and we learn respect for tools and respect for life we learn to protect life and our loved ones not to destroy it well I know I touched on a little bit again I'm a one person team pony team I put everything into my knives, my FMA attributes. Um, I make edge tools. So one of the things I'd say is if you want edge tools and good training tools, I make them exclusively for FMA. And of course, they fit with JKD and any other art and salat norm, but I designed them with FMA in mind. So I make functional trainers and fixed blade trainers. I make bolo trainers. I, may, I hand make trainers. You can find my tools. And I put the soul of a ballet song and FMA into my tools. Yes, I have live blades. Um, please be weary of all the people who, again, sell knives and tell you, look how good they cut. Any knife will cut. For us, because of FMA, we need to be able to go up the force continuum, down the force continuum, and my tools will be the best doula we doulo. They can be like a ballet song and do snap cutting, less than lethal. They can be in lethal mode and still do non-lethal motions and then shut back down. So. For me, one of my last comments is, I truly make tools that I think epitomize Filipino martial arts and the concepts. Um, do I think we need to approach it that way and support each other? Lots of different people make you know, bags, uniforms, whatever. I think we need to support each other as a group and help each other out and do it. And um, when we encourage people about what to carry, tools should make us do our work better, utilize energy, to accomplish more work and when we teach and the tools you use, when you use them, they should leave you space that you don't find out you're sitting in jail with the very people you wanted to protect yourself from. You know, that you need to have a, an ability and a way to use your tools safely. And I tell some of the guys, go, I would never carry a knife for say on the street ago. If you teach FMA, I have great trainers. Trainers are the most important thing, trainer drones. Uh, by the way, the reason I call them drones is drones are bees with no sting. Uh, knives Illustrated called me the father of the modern training knife, and I used to make wooden training knives from Remy because he'd just give us a stick, and I'd go, what's that? Well, problem, it, it represents a knife. And i go, well, that sucks. Oh, this stick represents a, a sword. Sir, there's no edge to it. There's no flat to it. So I actually used to make not wooden ones long before I started making metal ones you know, for him. But I think some of the last comments is people need to have an open mind. Boxing. Let me just pick for one second left turn out career about boxing. If you just learn boxing, you have a jab, you have a cross, you have a hook, and you have an uppercut. You become a Golden Gloves competition boxer. You have a jab, a cross, an uppercut, and a, and a hook. If you go into pros, you have a jab, a cross, an uppercut, and a hook. And when you become a world champion, if you want to get it, it goes, well, it's how you apply it. Where's your motion? Filipino martial arts are the same kind of thing. We have some basic concepts that, if applied right, teach us a great deal. There's complexity in the simplicity. But if you go to my main website, cssd-sc.com, all the contact information is there. And like I said, the newest one, which is for certification and you know long-distance training, and you have full video programs to go with it, uh, is bramfrankmodulartraining.com and you do Filipino martial arts, we need safe trainers, and using sticks or amorphic shapes do nothing. If you carry a, a folder, get a group of them to keep in your school that are functional folders so your students can practice opening and closing them and understanding them within the flow of what we do.